big national brands have a huge impact now because Google has moved the dials on localization a lot. Fortunately, they backed it off. I don't remember when you guys remember when they first went up, but they would take big thumbnails, they'd mash up the two lists. It was this big, gaudy looking thing in the middle. And it was for any term. And the, and the key there is looking to see how not how they rank when you type in Tampa Plumber, because that's kind of a no brainer. What Google is really working hard on is tying localization into queries that do not have a geo qualifier to them. So, and this is kind of a cool thing. This actually kind of plays into the data recovery space as well. So, in that business, it used to be there's really, no matter what you saw anywhere, there's really only two or three big companies that control it all. And everything else is in front, and all the drives get shipped to one. You know, there's a handful of companies that control the whole space. And the little guy that had the local data recovery shop, for him to show up and rank for data recovery was just impossible. So those guys abandoned that phrase and really focused on Tampa data recovery, right? And they only built links and they did that kind of stuff. Well now, localization the way it is now, those guys will show up for that phrase, but only in Tampa, right? So that's kind of cool. So I, I would start by looking at, we have internal tools where we take, we query and we can see how things are different from city to city, and also we look for, you know, we make a list of phrases that are geo and non-geo, is how we break it up. So what I want to do is identify the words that don't have a city name in it that generate localization for your client, right? Because that's, and see, obviously the places listing is tied into that. Once you can separate those words out and say, okay, these are localized, these are not, and also are they localized organically? So it's not always places listings. Um, 40 to 60 percent of even the organic listings now are flavored towards sites that don't have places, but are just you know. So a domain like you know, geo domains are the new exact match keyword in a lot of areas. So having a domain that says TampaPlumber.com, uh, Google will shape the organic. So the first thing you want to do is really assess how much the organic stuff is impacting that space, and then build a strategy from that. Um, and, you know, we call them roadblocks. We're always looking to see, we don't want to chase a term that looks great on paper, because search tool says it gets X amount of traffic, but if I don't have a places listing and a local presence in a city, like New York, Los Angeles, you know, we, we query and track the top 50 metros based on population, that's what we like to look at. If, if there's localized roadblocks, I don't want to have that as a strategy for a client because as high as I'll ever be able to get no matter what I do is underneath that local pad. If that doesn't generate click-throughs and traffic and ROI, I look like an idiot. And we spend a lot of money chasing the term because the data said it has a lot of volume, which it does, but it has a roadblock that we can't overcome right now. So when you first start being able to really understand that, I'd say start with, I like buckets of phrases in the 50 to 100, you know? Take that list of the most obvious things from the tool, and even if you gotta do it manually one at a time, and just log it and look at it and say, you know, here's a great phrase. Because sometimes the one you wouldn't pick on paper or in a spreadsheet from a keyword tool um, is the best one because it doesn't have a drill box. You can actually gain visibility for it. Once you have all that mapped out, then of course you have to deal with budget, but um, uh, you can usually find a path for the local guy. There's still a lot of great opportunity for that kind of stuff. Really, is it cornhole time? Yeah. Is anyone have one more? Okay. I got one. I have a, I've seen a couple different definitions of uh, anchor text diversity. I want to get your thought on it. Uh, it seems like it has a big part of uh, the, the Penguin algorithm. Anchor text diversity? Right. Well, like. Uh, some people are saying that you can just uh, do partial partial match. Like, so if you want blue fuzzy widgets, I could say uh, click here for blue fuzzy widgets. And blue glass uh, fuzzy widgets. <laughs> yeah. Or, or or just brand name. Well, what if you have a like a satellite site that the entire site is based around a money keyword? So it, in essence, the brand name of the site is a money keyword. And you're a fortunate individual. Uh, do, you, do you need to do all? Uh, uh, well. All like click here type things, or can you get away with uh, variations? Get away with variations. I love C have, phrases like that. <laughs> <laughs> get away with it. Which well, I mean, it's cool. No, I. And the I, variations yeah. have a search volume to them. Is is the uh, analysis through whether or not it's a, a keyword that people search for, 
Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So one, one of the things he's bringing up that is important is exact match domains and why they work. So you, you realize like, oh, it's not fair. And it, it really is ridiculous sometimes if you have, but the dirty little secret is exact match domains tend to only rank just for that phrase. So if diversity is your thing, exact match is not necessarily going to go. But the main, my theory on why they rank so good is that in a world where if we're looking at thresholds and anchor text, um, in those models I was talking about, if you take the time to do that, and I strongly suggest you do that, just take any query and then sample all the top ten, all their back links, I'm a spreadsheet idiot, like big, big nasty spreadsheets, but calculate, you know, SEO models will give you 20,000 links, and so we, we calculate the percentage and actually assign a anchor text exact match percentage. So we can look at a profile and say, whoa, 37% of your links say your phrase, right? When you start modeling the sites that Google, we know Google likes, um, exact match is way, way, way under double digits. Um, and typically domain and URL and brand matches are 60, 70, 80%. That's, that, that footprint is just super, super common because that's how natural links develop. So if you're going to penalize and create a threshold for that, you have to give an exact match domain a match because the exact match is also an exact match anchor text, right? So you can't apply that same filter to sites with an exact match keyword to domain thing because they would all have a threshold because people link using the brand name and the domain name. So if your brand and your website is bluefuzzywidgets.com, you're probably not going to take the hit for having 60, 70 percent of your anchor text in blue fuzzy widgets. But but is enough variance for me to say great blue fuzzy widgets, even though there's a search volume for that, or do I need to say I, I like to look at blue it blue as fuzzy widgets click here and just have a proximity? We like to break it down into exact match, partial match, um, branded, exact branded. And what what are those partial percentages match? Group um, I still like to keep all occurrences that have an exact match in under ten percent. Under ten. 